In our last video, we were looking at the uh, James Davidson house on the west side of the street. Uh, today, let's go on to the other side of the street on the east side and look at this beautiful white uh, home with the white columns. And I know it's not really a home, but it is a funeral home, Smith Funeral Home to be exact. But at one time, it was just a regular home. This photograph is said to be one of the earliest photographs of the city of Port Huron. And at the time of this photograph, a funeral home was actually a, a regular home occupied by Abram Stebbin. In the earliest city directory that I have access to, which is 1871, it shows that Abram Stebbins was a lumberman in Port Huron. I imagine he was a wealthy lumberman because most of them were at that time. He lived there with his wife and two children until at least 1873. The house was then occupied by Edmund B. Harrington. Mr. Harrington was the son of Daniel Harrington, who, of course, most of you know, was one of the founders of the city of Port Huron, and also who the Harrington Hotel was named after. Edmund Harrington was engaged in the lumber business in Richmondville and continued in the trade there for 10 years. In 1877, he associated with Henry McMorrin in the flouring mill business. Mr. Harrington was the active management of that business. And here you see a photo of that mill. The Harrington family lived there through the 1880s. By 1893, Charles H. Reynolds lived there. He was employed by the Jinx Company, which was a shipbuilding firm in Port Huron. And at the time Mr. Reynolds lived in his home, Jinx was located near the 7th Street Bridge. You can see the First Baptist Church in the background. I don't know what Mr. Reynolds did for Jinx Company, but it must have uh, been more than just a laborer to be able to afford a home like this. The Joseph Walsh family was the next family to live in this home. Mr. Walsh was a prosecuting attorney in Port Huron. He was also the city attorney as well and later on employed by the Avery Brothers and Walsh Law Firm, and in 1912 became the Circuit Court Commissioner. He was quite often addressed as Captain Joseph Walsh because of his earlier seafaring days. After Mr. Walsh's death, his family remained in the home until 1928, when it was purchased by the Smith family. They used it for both residents and their business, the Arthur Smith Funeral Home. A business that still continues today. I've always admired the front porch and the columns on the front of this place, and I thought probably the funeral home had something to do with that. But that's not the case. I don't know if it was like that originally, but I know it was like that in 1911, uh, as you look at this Sanborn map here. You can see the front porch that's illustrated by the red arrow. The Arthur Smith Funeral Company began in 1919 when its founder, Arthur E. Smith, left the employment of Albert Falk and went into business on 7th Street, and we looked at that in an earlier video. During the 1930s, Arthur Smith had a partner, uh, Harry Goff. For many years, both Arthur E. Smith and later Arthur B. Smith, his son, served as coroner of St. Clair County. In 1943, Arthur E. son, Arthur B. Smith, purchased Harry Goff's interest and joined him in the business. In 1964, they welcomed a third generation with the arrival of grandson, Arthur C. Smith. In 1965, the Smiths purchased the Bower Greenway Funeral Home in St. Clair. Arthur E. Smith passed away in April of 1966, and later that year, the Smiths gave up the ambulance service part of the business. While we're at it, why don't we take a look and see how the Smith uh, mode of transportation changed over the years. Nineteen seventy saw changes in the business when the funeral home in St. Clair was sold and the Smiths acquired the Albert A. Falk and Son funeral business located at the corner of 6th and Pine Street, which you see in this photograph here in the background. This was taken from the Goodyear store. 
Growth in the Port Huron community continued to move north and west, so in order to better position for that growth, the location on Hancock Street on the north side of town was built in 1975. That same year, the city of Port Huron purchased the Falk property so that a senior citizen facility could be constructed. In December of 1981, the business was sold to Service Corporation International of Houston, Texas. Arthur B. Smith passed away in August of 1995, and shortly after, Michael D. Smith, great-grandson of the founder, was hired by SCI as general manager. In June of 1997, father and son, Arthur C. and Michael Smith, repurchased the 1525 Hancock Street location and operated that business known as Family Funeral Home until the 7th Street location was also reacquired on June 2, 2000. At that time, the business was renamed Smith Family Funeral Home, with both locations back under the Smith family ownership and direction. I think Arthur E. Smith will be very proud of what his family accomplished, and that almost 100 years later, the Smith family would still own the business and still going strong. All right, as we mosey a little further down 7th Street and across Union Street, on the west side of the street, uh, we can just make out a, a home there behind the trees in the stoplight. I almost kept going past this house. The house fascinated me, but it always looked like there was something that was changed to the exterior of the home. I knew it was an old home. You can tell just by looking at the structure of the home. And I think I discovered what is missing. Look at that tower in the front of the house that goes up to the third floor, and it's just squared off on top. That just didn't make sense to me. I think somebody removed the top of it. I think at one time, uh, that tower, this house, looked more like this home here, which would certainly give it a Victorian look. As I researched it further, I went to this map, this illustrative map of 1894. These maps fascinate me because of the detail they give. Now, considering there weren't satellites in those days, this artist was very talented. And as we zoom in on this map, we can see this home, uh, what it originally looked like. Artists gave a pretty good rendition of it. And you can see that there's a top that's no longer squared off. I'm sure there's a name for that top, but I'll just call it a fancy roof. And it made me feel better to know I was right. This home had a connection to one of the most prominent businessmen in Port Huron, and his name was James W. Sanborn. Mr. Sanborn was born near Portland, Maine in April of 1813. He was the son of a physician, the third of a family of 11 children. In early youth, he gave evidence of great energy of character and keen powers of observation. He chose for his first venture a seafaring life and made frequent voyages to the West Indies. He also crossed the Atlantic Ocean repeatedly. He abandoned the sea after reaching the age of 21 and went to Port Huron in 1835 in company with Abner Coburn, since Governor of Maine, Charles Murrow, late of Detroit, and Joseph L. Kelsey. Together, they located 25,000 acres of land in St. Clair and Sanilac counties. And Mr. Sanborn, then but 21 years old, was left in charge of the purchases. The following year, 1836, he established himself in Lapeer County. In 1838 and again in 1846, he was elected to the legislature for Lapeer District. Mr. Sanborn was very earnest in politics as in other matters, and originally he uh, belonged to the Whig Party. He stood among the foremost organizers of the Republican Party. He represented his district as a delegate at that convention whose proceedings under the Oaks at Jackson, Michigan, have been accorded a page not only in the annals of the state, but also of national history. This was a state convention of anti-slavery men that was held in July 6, 1854 in Jackson, Michigan. It was to found a new political party. Uncle Tom's Cabin had been published two years earlier, causing increased resentment against slavery and the Kansas-Nebraska Act of May of 1854 threatened to make slave states out of the previously free territories. 
Since the convention day was hot and the huge crowd could not be accompanied in the hall, the meeting adjourned to an oak grove on Morgan's 40 on the outskirts of town. Here, a statewide slate of candidates was selected, and the Republican Party was born, winning an overwhelming victory in the elections of 1854. The Republican Party went on to dominate national parties throughout the 19th century. And this is an actual photograph of that gathering. Perhaps Mr. Sanborn is there. As a legislator, he showed the same habits of industry and faithfulness which so eminently characterized him in private life. In 1847, he was engaged in the dry goods and lumber business of Port Huron with his brother-in-law, Alva Sweet. Mr. Sweetser's death caused the dissolution of the firm in 1864. But as you can see from this directory of 1871, he was still in business, but it looks like with a different partner. J.M. would be his brother, John. But Mr. Sanborn didn't make his fortune in the dry goods business. He made his fortune in the lumber business. Mr. Sanborn had large lumber interests on the Saginaw, the Muskegon, and his tributaries, the Osable, the Thunder Bay River, Pine River, and also in the Upper Peninsula, and in Sheboygan. That was a lot of lumber to be cut down and a lot of money to be made. In 1853, he was elected to the House of Representatives, and in 1858, he was chosen commissioner of the state land office. Although not a member of any religious denomination, he was for many years actively connected uh, with the Congregational Church. Mr. Sanborn married three times, and at his death, which occurred in 1870, left a wife and three children. His third wife and widow, and I'll take a stab at the name here, Mahitable, never heard a name like that. Uh, anyway, this goes all the way back into the 1878s, and you can see that she was a resident in this house. And this is the only case I've ever run across where I see a widow in the city directories where the husband, uh, I don't think, lived there. Uh, the husband died in 1870, and in the 1871 directory, you can see that she lives at a different address, the corner of Six and Pine. Mr. Sanborn owned many properties, both in Port Huron and in Fort Gratiot. And my theory is the house on the corner of 7th and uh, Union was one of his properties, and his wife decided to move into that home. Her family lived in this home up into the 1930s, and then it was uh, purchased uh, by someone else and made into apartments. The directory could be wrong, and perhaps he did live in this home, but I doubt it. But whether he did or not, his widow certainly did. And so did his son. But I'm glad I didn't pass this house by, because I got to tell the wonderful story of James W. Sanborn. Came from Maine as a young man, sailed the seas, became an astute businessman, became a politician, and a prominent member of the city of Port Huron. When I go by this home, I'll always think of it as a Sanborn home. All right, that takes care of the north end of the block. Uh, I think in our next video, we'll just mosey down 7th Street and see what's on the south end. I'll give you a hint. It's a church, and the initials are St. Joseph. <laughs>